When I was um, already at high school, I know that you know I, I like to do science, mathematics, or physics. But then I went to engineering school because I thought, well, it was uh, very nice because it's applied. So I was happy at University of Technology. But then during my so-called engineer's work, I was actually caught by this fundamental part of the of the research. You know, try to go very deep and try to understand what really happens on the very basic level. You know, we have certain laws in physics, Newton laws, we have quantum mechanics. So why cannot we simply calculate everything from the beginning on? And that's what uh, caught my attention that, you know, apart from engineering, there's a lot of other things to do too that is very interesting. So it spans from completely from instrumentation development, engineering, to going all the way to chemistry, materials, and all the way up to Expect the experiment itself and its interpretation in which you actually do need a lot of theory. So this whole bandwidth of, of research facets that is actually for me a lot of fun. We are here at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Physics of Solids. Uh, our mission is to uh, develop and study new materials with uh, new properties. It is uh, based on a very close collaboration between chemistry and physics. We have four directors here. Two of the directors are chemists and two of the directors are physicists. And the work involves a lot of experiments, but also a lot of theory. I want to know how materials work. Uh, we know that you know, um, materials consist of atoms. There are 100 kinds of atoms. You can build them in, you can arrange them in various ways, and you know that there are electrons there, and the electrons start to move around. And you want to know what those electrons are going to do and how they are related to the properties. Is okay? Okay, good. Okay, point eight. Ah, what you see here, this is the spectrometer. This is a, a mere transfer chamber. Here is... <laughs> so-called MBE chamber, molecular beam epitaxy. Here make, we make thin films in an atomic layer by layer method. There's another one, a bigger one, which also make uh, thin films. So what you see here is basically uh, every period is one atomic layer finished. So you can really order, I want to have 50 monolayers of RN304. We can make it for you. Um, working also in a particular field of corrosive systems, namely in so-called transitional metal oxides. It's a very rich field with a lot of new developments because you know there are electrons there, you know they interact, but you, do, you don't know exactly how they interact. Right? And sometimes they also remember that those electrons are circling around certain atoms. And then you have atoms next to each other. And then this atomic character of the electrons can be very different if you go from one atom to another type of atom, from one element to another one type of element. Even the same element could be having quite different properties. So all this stuff makes that the system becomes highly uh, unpredictable what it does. Right? So you can have completely new properties uh, without actually knowing that you will get it before you start. Well, for me, it's, uh, well, science is one part is, of course, uh, is just work, right? You have, you, have, you have certain goals that you have to want to pursue. But of course, you start to dream on a bigger scale, right? And this is very much a guessing game. It's based on intuition, what you could do and not could do. And, and, and for me, it's actually very hard to predict what will come out. There are so many surprises actually in the last couple of years, you know, uh, just take about the so-called iron pnictides. Yeah? It turns out to be a superconductor. You know, I would never thought, how can an iron compound be superconducting at all? Yeah? Because iron is magnetic and usually magnetism and superconductivity exclude each other, right? And now suddenly you have these iron pnictides that give you superconductivity. And not only that, they give you very high uh, critical temperatures. So apparently, if you're close to some instability, you can get surprises. So this kind of surprises we want to, to know better. Under what conditions we can get surprises, and how can it play out? So what you see here is, is, is a crystal being grown. 
So this is uh, at uh, roughly 1,300 degrees or something like that. And there's a piece of oxide. And here is molten. And during the melt, you generate your crystals. And you, in order to get the perfect, you have to rotate them like a piece of glass. And that's a way where we make crystals actually like this. So the atoms here are ordered with the atoms there. It is so difficult sometimes to go straight to what you want. Uh, because sometimes Mother Nature does not allow you to make the material. That's one thing. Right? In, in my field, strong correlated systems, you know, if the computers becomes, let's say, a thousand times faster, that would not help me too much in solving the problem. And that's the fun of solid state physics in which you can do the strong correlated system. The problem is so large that you cannot tackle it with computers. The only solution is you have to be smart. You have to make models, right? And then, of course, faster computer will help because it can make you more complicated models. But brute force only will not work. The important thing for me is also, that's something with, with working with students, is that when students came with results that, let's say, is unexpected, you have to pay attention because those are the most interesting. And, and, and that is something that uh, I think as, as maybe as a, as a professor, as a manager, say, you have to be very, very, very careful there because that's, sometimes you find gold there.